It's a cool April morning in the mountains of southern Appalachia. Past few nights we've had temperatures down in the 30s. So this is still way too early to be planting those warm weather things like tomatoes and uh, peppers and our squash and our green beans, our melons, those kind of things. But we do already have quite a bit going in the garden, all of our spring vegetables. This will be my first garden tour of the season to give you a peek at kind of what's going on. I do have a gardening playlist that you can check out if you're interested. So we'll start right here where I'm at. Not much going on, but just a little. We have back here in this bed, long bed that you can see, that's where our blackberries are. And there's blackberry buds. I can see the bloom, the bud of the bloom on. Uh, we've not had, we have blackberry winter in Appalachia, if you've ever heard of that. I have a video about it if you haven't, about the little winters of Appalachia. So I know once those bloom, there'll be another little cold spell, kind of like what we've had this week. Right here, this cattle panel that you can see one end of it, that's, we don't have anything planted there right now, except we have two grapevines that we've planted. We planted two there last year, and that was the purpose of the cattle panel, to give them something eventually to grow up. In the meantime, we planted uh, some beans there until they got more established, the grapevines. But if you remember last year, we had that late May, kind of mid-May hard freeze in my area, at least we did, and that freeze actually killed both of those grapevines that we had last year. So I'm hoping that that doesn't happen this year, but if I do hear of a late freeze this time, you can believe I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover those up. And it's funny how those kind of freezes will happen. It killed both of these, which they were just, you know, just starting out, so they weren't established. But on the other side of the house, where our most of our, or our other two grapevines that have been growing for many years, didn't hurt them at all. These two beds you can see behind me, that's usually where we put our cucumbers so they can grow up that trellis, the cattle panel trellis. We put some of our melons there, maybe some of our peppers, but there's nothing in those beds currently except weeds. I have a lot of weeding to do. Back in late winter, Matt and I put a layer of compost on all of our beds, and what's happened between now and then is they've filled with weeds, so they need to be weeded well before we actually start planting those warm weather crops. One other bed we have in this part of the garden is an herb bed. We have some oregano and some lemon balm and some valerian and things like that that come back every year, some yarrow, and then we also plant some other things in it. That's kind of Katie's little bed. She loves to make calendula oil. Uh, that's why we usually put the flowers there. She loves to harvest the lemon balm for tea. Miss Cindy loves that lemon balm. And also, of course, we use the oregano. This side, kind of on the back side of what I was just showing you, uh, now the greenhouse is just right here behind me. We have some green stalks and then we have some grow bags. We planted potatoes in grow bags last year and they did very well. We don't really have a great place. Uh, we're limited on space and room to grow potatoes here where we're at. But we did in the green, in the the use the grow bags last year and they did very well. So that's what we did again uh, this year. And then in our green stalks, I have strawberries. I have a few blooms on some of the ones I planted last year due to the great generosity of my friend Rachel and I was able as the year went on to kind of get them to continue down growing as each time they they grew a little shoot I would put it in another pocket of the green stalk and so that one's full of strawberries and then uh, we also our 4-H was selling plants I got some more plants strawberry plants to do my other green stalk so some of you asked me if I would show about it, show the green stalk. Now there's all kinds of videos. You could just search green stalk and you'll find a lot of people talking about them. But, um, and I first found them online from probably one of the homesteaders, maybe the Stivers, I think is who I, who I first saw talking about the green stalk. So, but they work really well, especially if you have a limited space, even more limited than we do. Corey, someone got Corey one's wonderful gift for her and Austin's wedding, got her and Corey one, I mean, Corey and Austin one so they they plan to use it because they don't really their house is where it's at doesn't have uh, much of a yard and even the yard they do have is really steep it's kind of one of those mountain houses which is a really nice house but it just doesn't lend itself to gardening very well 
So the green stock is a good option for anyone like that. But also for people like us that just want, we wanted to, I wanted to grow strawberries. Well, and that one thing issue you have with strawberries is uh, because they are so low to the ground, it's hard to keep things out of them and then it's they kind of get um, in my area where I'm at because of the dampness we have we have so much rain uh, Appalachia the southern Appalachia is a temperate rainforest is that a lot of times they suffer from mildew and things like that so the green stalk comes in pieces these plastic pieces and you can get them in different um, sizes and different colors and then they snap together you can see all the way down some of my strawberries some of my blooms there. And then this top part, you can see it's kind of dirty. I need to clean it out. But it's got, a, a, it's a basin that catches water when it rains and there's a little hole that then will take the water down through the, uh, through all the little cups or you can water it yourself. You can pour water in there and that way it, it will water, distribute the water evenly. So the greenhouse, what we have going on is our mostly our tomatoes, and this time of the year they really start growing by leaps and bounds as the the sun begins to shine uh, warmer every day, and it really gets warm in here. I still have my peppers inside under the grow lights because it is still getting cooler overnight, and it seems like it stunts them more in my what my experience is than it does the tomatoes. We do have a heater in here that we turn on if it's going to be really cold at night to, to protect the, kind of offer the tomatoes a little bit of uh, extra warmth. We also have, I have some like herbs and some um, one or two melons and things like that that I've started in here that's not even sprouted yet. They've not even germinated. I can never resist starting stuff in here, but it doesn't always really pay off by the time it kind of gets the transplant shock of, of planting it in the dirt outside or in the soil. Um, it's almost like the ones I direct sow do just as well, but I just can't resist because I love starting things. I love, I love to garden. Um, I did start inside this this year for the first time my beets I started inside and I've already put them out in the garden but they didn't really do as good as the ones like so I planted I put them out in the garden but I also direct sowed they're at the same they're at the exact same size but I believe where I my mistake I made was now the peppers have done really great that I did in the house but I used um Here's one of the ones that I used, you know, a little little cells to, to actually start the seeds of the beets, the cabbage, and also the peppers. But I up-potted the peppers really quickly. Well, I put off up-potting the beets and the cabbage because I thought, well, I'm going to put them outside anyway. So, you know, it's just going to be another week or two and I can put them outside. But I think I should have definitely up-potted them and they would have had, they would have been a larger size by the time I did transplant them. Last year, I just started my cabbage out here. I didn't try to do it inside. I just did it out here, and I think that worked better. So next year, I'll probably go back to at least the cabbage out here. Maybe the beets I'll try again inside and then try up-potting them to see if that helps. This part of the garden right here, we don't have anything planted in our big long one of our big long beds. That's where we always put our tomatoes. I do have some of my Malabar spinach. It reseeds itself, and I noticed this week that there's some of it popping through the ground, so it's volunteering and coming up. We, this is kind of the area too though that we have our apple trees this largest tree that you can see there we've had it for i don't even know 10 years you can see how big it is so it's a pretty old tree and then uh, we lost one of our trees so last year we planted two more apple trees and they're just small of course and, and it's going to take a while for them to, to catch up with that one and then i have one the smallest apple tree i have is one granny started from uh, Tim, Farmer Tim down the road. He has apples and Granny gets them every year. And it was one that she started from one of his apples, like a seed from one of his apples. So I don't know if it will be, if it will actually ever uh, produce or what will happen with it. But she's like, this is, I planted this, I grew it, you take it home and plant it. So I did what Granny said. A couple of folks have asked me to talk about our raised beds. When I first started gardening years ago, uh, of course I grew up gardening with Granny and Pat, but they never had raised beds. They just done the old fashioned method of tilling up the whole garden and planting. But I was, I would research and think about stuff and I discovered that really raised, raised beds. And so I thought I had just stumbled onto this wonderful thing and I, I 
even have a video where I talk about it, but I called Pap one day and told him and he laughed at me and said, Tipper, that's just patch farming. People's been doing that forever. So um, at that time, when we were, Matt and I was just getting into gardening, and of course money was really tight and we couldn't afford to go buy material to build beds or anything like that. And then there was also the, the part of Matt and I both like to use what we have. We like to use, be uh, resourceful and frugal and um, I guess recycle things, all those kind of things are always top in our mind. So one thing that I had an endless supply of was rocks from the creek. So I spent hours and days getting rocks out of the creek to line my beds, flower beds and some of our other beds. I remember one time I was down there, uh, and this has been, I mean, you know, 15, more than that probably, but at least 15 years ago. And I was down there getting the rocks and throwing them in the bed of the truck. And then I would haul them up here and unload them. And Papa Tony was here and he just thought I was doing an awful lot of work. <laughs> he was kind of amazed. But all that hard work I did way back then, I'm still using today. Those rocks still line all my bed. So it was definitely worth that hard effort, hard work that it took me back then. Another thing we like to use, you can see kind of behind me that bed up there, is that we love to use uh, timber from our land, just go cut trees. Now Matt is the person, I couldn't do that by myself. He can cut the trees, I couldn't do it at all, I can't even hardly help him. But he can, you know, he knows, thankfully has the skills to cut the trees safely and all that kind of stuff. And then he knows how to put them together uh, so that they don't just fall apart. You can see that's maybe two or three uh, logs put together. Now what happens to those over time, they deteriorate, they rot away, they rot into your soil and they have to be replaced. That may be, I think we've replaced that one at least once if not twice. And some of ours desperately need to be replaced this year. Especially, uh, there's two beds up here that desperately, or actually there's three. And obviously we're not going, <laughs> we're not going to do that. It's the time for that is in the winter when you'd want to be doing that kind of stuff. So it's, it's probably too late for this year. But the wonderful thing about those kind of raised beds I found is over the years, every year we amend the soil. So as you continue to add stuff to it, it builds up, you know, so even the one, there's one that's pretty much, there's nothing around it, but there's still that kind of a raised bed in the yard, in the grass, you know. Well, of course, that's, I wish we had something better protecting it from grass creeping in and all that. But for now, that will be fine. Uh, and we will grow in it and things will grow just fine. It's usually where I put my Tommy toes in that, in that bed. Uh, but there's all sorts of wonderful different ways of making raised beds. Now there's certainly all kinds of tutorials you can search on YouTube and find. There's the ones you can buy ready-made. I've seen some of those big metal ones. They look really nice. I'd like to have them, but they're, they're kind of expensive for me. But there's just so such a variety of ways. But it does, um, you know, I was saying that how Pap and Granny always just tilled up, that old method. There's a lot of people today that believe in the no-till gardening, and that's fine. That's wonderful. Everybody just needs to find their own way. But there is something to be said for, the, like, the no-till thing, where if you can just put some cardboard or something, you can. there's lots of videos about that, too, and then start amending on top if you have a really bad soil. Like, we have, our soil's not great. It is over the years because we've amended it so much. It grows very well now, but it's under, like, where I'm standing right now is red clay and really rocky, <laughs> really rocky, uh, but lots of red clay, which doesn't grow very well. But over time, you can really improve the soil. And that is kind of if you don't want to go the till or you don't have a tiller or, or you know, don't have anyone to har your garden, as we would say, uh, don't have a tractor or anything like that, you can try that method. You can, and there's lots of information, but basically you're laying some, a barrier down or you maybe you just dig up the grass in that area and then you start laying stuff on top of it. You know, if you think about leaves out of the woods and uh, dirt and branches and things that'll decompose. Um, and if you're lucky like us to have chickens, a layer of chicken litter, uh, and maybe some compost you've had that's kind of sitting over to the side and now is ready to be used. You have to be careful sometimes with chicken litter not to use it when it's too hot, as we would say. You have to kind of let it, um, let some of the uh, stuff in it decompose or it might burn up your plants but there's just all kinds of ways to frugally go at it's what i'm trying to say and that's what we did getting creek rocks and then getting um you know timber out of the woods logs out of the woods small saplings at one time we used and that was the one bed up there that has nothing around it the last thing that was around it many years ago probably i don't know probably 15 more 
or maybe not that long, maybe 10 or something years ago. Anyway, we did mushrooms. We grew shiitake mushrooms. We have to inoculate the logs, and you have to use oak logs, you know, a certain length, and then you stack them up. And we did that and, and enjoyed them for years. And then they finally, you know, they'll finally, the logs start to deteriorate and the mushrooms just quit producing. So one year when we were needing to redo one of those beds, I said, hey, let's, why don't we use those mushroom logs that's still in the woods there? They're not, you know, they're not going to last long, but we could use them since they're already cut and we're in a hurry. So we did. And it's funny, once they, I just changed in the location uh, that year. Once we put, put them around the bed, we had shiitake mushrooms again. Once, I guess, taking them out of the shaded area where they were and putting them more open where the water could really hit them, uh, we had another flush or two of shiitake mushrooms. So that was a good move to try to use those. So when I did the video about the hostas, a lot of people said, Tipper, would you show us the, the bed once the hostas actually grow? They were just little spears poking out uh, at that time. So now, as you can see, the whole bed is filled with hostas, and you can see that I really need to divide them and move some to another place. These long cattle panels is where we always put our green beans, so we don't have anything planted there. In these first two little sections of it, though, I do have some spring peas planted, and they've almost reached the little, the top of the, or the bottom of the trellis so that they can start climbing. What I will do is I will leave those um, and then plant the rest once it's warm enough with green beans, but once those peas are completed and we tear them out, then I will plant more green beans there, which will kind of be like a succession planting, uh, and hopefully the others will already be started and doing well, and then these will kind of be coming behind them that I plant next. This part of our garden just continues on. As it goes on down the driveway, it gets more narrow. And all the way at the bottom down there where it is narrow, the most narrow part is where our blueberry bushes are. We've grown blueberries for, I don't know, you know, for a long, long time. And it's funny, over that time, it, there's been like two years that birds got our blueberries. The other years, they ignored them. So, but one of those years was last year. It's just like overnight, they're gone. Your berries are gone. The very first time it happened was probably, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago. And I would have swore, I mean, I, I just wanted to say, how could they overnight eat them all? So this year, I'm going to try to cover them once the fruit actually uh, starts appearing and see if that helps because I don't want to take any chances since it happened last year. They didn't get them all last year, but they got a lot of them, a lot of them. And I love blueberries, so I'm not interested in sharing uh, with the birds. But this part of the, of the bed here that you can see, I have a lot of flowers there. And over the years, I've kind of inched back on my flowers and inched back and kept making room for for food so that we could feed our family. And this is where we usually put a lot of our spring things. So I have green onions, uh, two different plantings of them. I started the first ones and then uh, several weeks later planted the ones here in front. We have some radishes and we have some carrots. In this part of the garden, we have um, kind of a giant pile of mushroom compost. We really like to use mushroom compost. We've used it often during the year, over the years, and it really works well for us. In my local area, it's pretty easy to get. I'm not sure about where you live, but uh, like our local feed store has it, carries it, and then some other places do as well. Behind me, there's a long uh, row of garlic. That's where our garlic is. Also, I have some more onions down here, Egyptian walking onions. I used to grow those many, many years ago due to the generosity of a blind pig reader, Bill Dotson. And somehow, uh, it was I had them in one of my beds in the back of the house, and somehow I let them get away from me. We dug it out, maybe when we dug it out to plant the asparagus, and we accidentally dug them up. But he sent me some more, and I have those growing. So if you've never seen it, uh, Egyptian walking onions you can they're kind of they're it's not that they're perennial or maybe I guess you would consider them but they just they um, they reproduce not by the bulb but they grow bulbs on top like a lot of onions have uh, flower heads these will have little bitty um, bulbs that appear it's i'm not doing a very good job explaining it but if you search for them you'll see exactly what i mean and then as those bulbs appear and the plants get heavy and they fall over well then those bulbs will reseed themselves or start growing and hence they can walk you know as, as that happens over and over they can they can spread but you can research and find out more about them also in this part of the garden, I have some more spring stuff. I have some lettuce. I have those beets that I was talking about, the ones I self-sowed or direct sowed, and then the ones I started inside. And you can see there's not much difference. 
Uh, the two lettuces that I have growing here are two of my favorites, Paris Island. I really like that one. And then Jericho. Jericho is my favorite because it, it has a good taste and all that, but it lasts, when it starts getting hot, it doesn't bolt. It, it will grow up into the warm weather before it finally gives out on you. I mean, it's really, really, I've been so pleased with how long it will continue to grow and be flavorful, not get bitter uh, into even when the heat, you know, even when it gets really hot. We're also growing our cabbage in this part of the garden, and we have it row cover. We have some cover over it to protect it, not from the cold or anything, but to protect it from pests, uh, from insects. We grew it like that last year for the first time, and it did so well that I will never, unless I had to, grow cabbage without row cover. It protects it from the larva, from the moth that lays the little, lays their eggs, and then it turns into worms, and the cabbage worms get on them, and the slugs and all that. Um, it just made for the pristine cabbage, the prettiest cabbage cabbage I've ever grown for sure. And the cabbage inside it, it's been planted for several weeks now. It's doing pretty well, but it's odd that the upper part of it is doing way better than the lower part. Uh, and we did enrich the soil, and this is the part of the garden where generally forever, always, I guess, every time we have a load of compost and mulch or something like that, often we dump it right here because we're limited on space. So that means usually this is really the best dirt on the whole place. But for some reason, this lower part of the cabbage is not doing as well as that upper part, uh, the upper two rows. I've kind of got, it's weird, I've got uh, one long row and then half of a row kind of. But no, last year we planted the cabbage up in front of the green beans and they did really, really good. And we would have put them there again this year, but um, I'm, all the years that I've done my business has been online, Blind Pig and the Acorn, and of course now the videos, but we had videos for Blind Pig and the Acorn too. I have struggled with not having high speed internet. And for many years, I just had satellite. I had dial-up to begin with, which was terrible. There's just nothing available in my area. For the past few years, I've had, um, it is a satellite, but it's a different. It's not HughesNet or something like that. And it was a local company, SkyTech, and it was so much better. I mean, it's just like leaps and bounds <laughs> better. But what has happened in the last two years is the signal that actually feeds SkyTech in our area, there's a tower just over the mountain there, has become uh, compromised. And for whatever reason, they can't, they can't fix it. I mean, there's just, they're not gonna fix it. They're not gonna put another tower or anything. So it will just gradually deteriorate till it's gone. Uh, so it's been a struggle. But wonderful news is that I have recently found out in the last year that I, we qualified for fiber optic from our local EMC. So I'm so excited about it. Uh, and I even have the box on the outside of my house. So I know it's gonna come true. <laughs> Uh, beyond exciting for me. I don't have to go somewhere else to upload videos. But all that to say, our power goes underground. When Matt and I first moved in all those years ago, uh, we w lived here two days before I had Corey and Katie, before we had them. And at that time, we were really trying to get into the house before the twins come along. And I can't really remember the reason, but um, the wonderful nice lady Sandy Laney that worked there she was trying to help us out at the EMC and she was like I'm gonna get power to that house so those babies can can go home to their home you know so you can get in there and for whatever reason I can't remember it was they could do it faster if we had underground and if Matt dug the ditch so he dug it with a mattock <laughs> dug the ditch from our our pole or we don't have a pole but from our house down to Steve's pole uh, through the wood so that's how our power goes well when the EMC first come out to say where they would put the fiber optic that's where they were going to put it and it goes straight through our garden but then on the day the people actually come to put it they did not put it there they put it up the road but by that point my cabbage was already planted and of course we were not going to move them one other thing that we have in this part of the garden i actually have it in a few other places too but it's comfrey so I've been growing comfrey for many years and I've only used it primarily because I think it's a beautiful plant and I love the flowers and the bees love the flowers. And then also you can use the leaves, make a great compost. Uh, the girls have always wanted to make something out of it medicinal, but we've not. But recently, on if you've ever watched um, Billy at Perma Pastures Farm, you should check him out. Got lots of great content. But recently, I noticed that he, or I've seen a video where he was talking about how wonderful it is to use comfrey as a 
barrier around your fruit tree so if you plant it around your fruit trees it kind of helps protect them but then also those wonderful leaves that are so nutrient rich are right there handy for you to for you to cut off and then mulch around your fruit trees or your fruit bushes with so i'm anxious to try that this year i'm going to dig some of mine up uh, that's been growing for so many years and separate it out and try that one question about gardening that I get asked often is how in the world do I keep the deer from eating my, my vegetables and eating my flowers? Thankfully, that's just a problem I've never had to deal with. There are deer in our area up in the woods, but here in Wilson Holler, where I live, there are a lot of dogs uh, that are, not a lot, but there are several dogs, I should say, that are loose and they're free to roam around at will. So they keep those deer at bay. They keep them out of the yards, out of the gardens. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. I'll often hear my brother Steve, his dog Molly, I'll hear her barking and I'll wonder what she's barking at. And I'll see her out of the corner of my eye, go by the window, she roams around the yard. So that's that's the, how we keep the deer out of our garden. For those of you who suffer with it, I'm not suffer with deer um, eating your plants. I couldn't imagine doing all that work and then coming out and it all being mowed down i'd be so depressed i'd be so hard so disheartening and so discouraging but i'm not really a good person to tell you what works and what doesn't work of course like you i've i've read that you know human hair would scare them off and there's noise makers and uh, sprays and things like that but i don't really have any good advice because i've never had to deal with that so I hope you enjoy getting this first peek at my garden, my first spring garden tour of 2022. I hope you'll come back through the summer uh, as I make a garden here in Appalachia is what we would say, are you gonna make a garden this year? We make a garden every year. Uh, we love the wonderful food that gives sustenance to our bodies and feeds our family. It's so rewarding to harvest all that goodness and put it in jars or put it in the freezer or dry it and put it in bags and then to get to eat it and feed it to your family is just wonderful.